I'm Tori Weber, Associate Director of Programs and Fellowships at the Kenyon Review. Um, and this event is part of our week-long literary festival. Um, so I hope that you have already been to some of our events, and I hope you will make it to the events we have going on for the rest of the week as well. Um, tomorrow at 4.30 in Cheever Room, we have a reading with Don Davies. Um, she is the recipient of the GLCA New Writers Award in Fiction this year. Um, and Friday is our main event, the Denham Sutcliffe Memorial Lecture, an evening with T.C. Boyle. That's at 8 o'clock p.m. in Brandy Recital Hall. Um, so I hope you all join us for those events. For today's event, Cultural Malaise, Writers on Social Responsibility and the Rhetoric of Change, um, I will ask you first to join me in silencing your phones. Um, and I'm gonna introduce Ira Sukrungrong, and then um, as the discussion unfolds, he will introduce the rest of our readers. Um, I also wanna point out that there are books by all of these wonderful writers for sale in the lobby, and I'm sure they would be happy to sign those books if you were to buy those books. So take advantage of that as well. Ira Sukrungrong is the author of the memoir, Southside Buddhist and Top Thai, The Adventures of Buddhist Boy. The short story collection, The Melting Season, and the poetry collection, In Thailand, It Is Night. He is the co-editor of two anthologies on the topic of obesity, What Are You Looking At? The First Fat Fiction Anthology, and Scoot Over Skinny, The Fat Nonfiction Anthology. He is the recipient of the 2015 American Book Award, New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Nonfiction Literature, an Arts and Letters Fellowship, and the Emerging Writers Fellowship. His work has appeared in many literary journals, including Post Road, The Sun, and Creative Nonfiction. He is one of the founding editors of Sweet, a literary confection, and is now the Richard L. Thomas Professor of Creative Writing here at Kenyon College. Welcome, Ira. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to this panel, Cultural Malaise, Writers on Social Responsibility and the Rhetoric of Change. I'm Ira, I'm a professor in the English department, um, and I have the honor of being today's panel moderator. Before we start, there are some copies of the things the panelists will be reading today, so if you, in case you, you uh, need a copy, please ask now, does anyone need a copy? Would you like a copy? We have one back there. Um, if you want to get a hold for, uh, after the panel of the copies of the things we've read, you know, please ask Tori, or, and, and if we run out, we'll make sure that we'll email them to you somehow. Okay. All right. Um, if there aren't enough, uh, okay, so this panel is inspired by the work of T.C. Boyle, who is this year's recipient of the Kenyon Review Award for Literary Achievement. What is astounding about Boyle's work is not the 28 books he has published in his career, so that's pretty freaking astounding. It is the topics in which Boyle writes about our environment, environmental crisis in the novel, the Terranox, his meditation on gun violence in the harder that they come, illegal immigration in Southern California, and the Tortilla Curtain. Boyle's newest novel, Outside Looking In, the story of the Loney family, the earlier experimentation of LSD led by the historical figure Timothy Leary, asked the question of what is science and what is selfish pleasure? When Tori asked me to, to, to moderate this panel, my immediate response was, absolutely. Why wouldn't I be? In the three years, uh, in the last three years, I've, I'm going through a midlife crisis <laughs> as a teacher and an artist. And though I did not buy myself a fancy muscle car, I've been awake at night thinking about my responsibility as a writer and teacher. For me, the two are connected. This midlife crisis coincides with the birth of my son, Bodhi, a boy born a week after the post-tragedy in Orlando, where a man walked into a gay nightclub and extinguished 49 lives. My son's birth, and if you are a parent or if you decide to become a parent, wreaks havoc on your entire belief system. Now, what, once, what, what was once a creative outlet for me to explore the things I was curious about included someone else, someone more important than myself. And I consider myself pretty damn important. <laughs> uh, joining me in my midlife crisis today 
are phenomenal writers and thinkers and humans. We're not there yet. We're not there. Okay. Some of us. I'm just preparing you, preparing you, right? Uh, Our phenomenal writers, thinkers, and humans, Kea Parson and Ruth Awad and Orchid Tierney. In the next hour or so, we will discuss the very thing that keeps me up at night, that has made me a tight fist of anxiety. We will discuss the ghost that shadows me, I mean us, uh, every time I, I mean we, engage in the act of creation. They didn't know this, but this panel is really a therapy session for me. <laughs> How do we writers talk back, talk with, talk about the world we live in? A world that at times is on the brink of chaos, if not in the midst of chaos. Today, I'm happy not to be alone in my fear. It's always great to share your fears. Kea, Ruth, Orkin, and myself will read a bit from our work and talk about the decisions that have guided us in the creation of our work. Afterwards, uh, we'll, I'll ask some really difficult questions and turn some questions over to the audience. All right, intros. Kea Parsman is my Keithley House office mate. Often we share our woes of parenting, our boys who do not sleep through the night, the interesting new words they are learning at school. <laughs> Kea and I, we share a lot of our woes. She has a, and she also has this gift. She would send me these long text messages in a matter of seconds, which I love receiving, if I'm, but I am slow to respond. Kea is the author of Ruins of Us, which won the Michener Copernicus Award for debut novel, and The Unraveling of Mercy Lewis, an incredible book set in a small Texas town, suddenly in chaotic upheaval, when a newborn is discovered in a gas station dumpster. It is a book that take, tackles the idea of ownership of the female body, told from the point of view of a girl who doubts the world she is raised in, this evangelical world, and begins to see the hypocrisy in it. Kea teaches fiction in Kenya. Ruth Awad and I have known each other for over 10 years now. She's the reason why my mom is mad at me, because she's the artist of four of my tattoos. <laughs> because of this, my mom tried to scrub one tattoo off with a Brillo pad. Ruth received her MFA at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, my alma mater, and her poems have appeared in poetry, the Missouri Review, the Rumpus, the Adroit Journal. She's the author of the poetry collection Set to Music, A Wildfire, winner of the 2016 Michael Waters Poetry Prize, and the 2018 Ohioana Book Award for Poetry. Set to Music is an extraordinary collection. Ruth chronicles her father's life, a survivor of the Lebanese Civil War, in her poems, there is devastating sadness, guilt, and the monumental task of refining the self in America, a sense of belonging, a sense of worth. If you were at Ruth's, Ruth's reading yesterday, she said one of the best lines ever. I have a theory about sadness and grief, Ruth says. If you pile enough dogs on them, they become bearable. <laughs> and orchid tyranny. About Orchid, I will use what my 17-year-old stepdaughter said of her on the first time she met Orchid. Orchid, I mean, Orchid is like the coolest person I have ever met. <laughs> when I asked my daughter if she thought I was cool, she walked away. <laughs> the pleasure of being in Orchid's presence is that you feel valued and listened to. She possesses a calm about her, a calm that is both diplomatic and insightful, and able to talk me away from writing terse emails to students about good manners. <laughs> this calm is not in her newest collection of poems, A Year of Misreading the Wildcats, nor should it be, but Orchid's insight is. In this collection, these poems coupled with her Polaroid pictures speaks back to the ecological disaster we exist in, asking the most difficult of questions, like what does it mean to know our extinction and do it anyway. And this line from the opening poem, Carbon Sink, I have a frog called plastic in my throat. I fantasize about the inverse possibilities of oily writing. Folks, Orchid is so cool. <laughs> I'll shut up now and have my friends share their experience. Kea will be first, followed by Ruth, then Orchid. And then I'll read a small, angry essay. Afterwards, we'll go straight to questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Ira. It's so nice to be here with you all. Um, and thank, thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us on this chilly afternoon, um, especially students. I know this is a crazy time of year. You're all, according to my students, 
exhausted uh, and at the end of your tether. So thanks for being here. Um, so it's interesting. I, I love this topic, Ira, and I love this idea of like a group therapy session. I think that's what a lot of readings are, right? Um, we can have pause um, in the presence of art and um, sort of move away from the Twitterverse um, where things exist in black and white uh, or in 140 characters and move into long form, move into the gray areas um, of our world. And I think that is what is perhaps most important um, to me about art is that it provides us with this space uh, where we can meditate on these difficult topics. Um, we're not writing headlines, you know, we're going beyond that. Um, it's also, I, as a, <coughs> mostly a novelist and a fiction writer, I get incredibly frustrated uh, because, you know, as with my text messages, my creative writing <laughs> is also very long <laughs> and um, takes a long time for me to write a book. I'm in, now in the fourth year of writing a draft of um, my current novel. So I often feel that I can't respond to our society and our um, what's going on in our country and in our world as quickly as I would like to. Um, and I often, so I was born in Saudi Arabia uh, on, not on an oil compound, I was actually born in the city just uh, outside the oil compound, but my father worked for Aramco, which is the Arabian American oil company, now Saudi Aramco, the largest oil company in the world, um, about to make the most, or has just made, um, the most uh, expensive IPO in the history of IPOs. So in a way, I felt like I had I couldn't avoid being a political writer, um, which is something as a child, uh, obviously I had no awareness of my circumstances. I just thought, hey, I live in this great little town that's you know, like a little American town set down in the middle of the Saudi desert. It's not really that interesting. It's just we ride our bikes around and um, it's safe and I love my friends and you know my parents are happy everyone sort of lives in these cookie-cutter houses it seemed to me a very simple <coughs> life and one that really was not worth uh, writing about and so uh, now of course as an adult looking back on that life uh, I think oh my god <laughs> like what was going on there uh, why was my dad uh, you know incredibly left-leaning uh, gentlemen, um, why was he working in service to a regime that was incredibly um, autocratic and uh, repressive in a lot of ways? So, of course, um, in order to find these answers, there are no easy answers. I, I turn to fiction and I turn to creative writing to explore some of these subjects and in a way to get to know the country where I had been born because um, even though my parents, my mother also was raised in Saudi Arabia um, on the compound. And so um, anyway, we have this long attachment to this country and I, I wanted to figure out just what it meant to me um, and if I could call it my home. Um, and I still don't know the answer to that question, <coughs> but um, I, I'm, I just am endlessly curious about this Saudi American relationship um, and what's funny too is oftentimes, you know, Saudi Arabia is always in the news, right? There's always something sensational happening there, uh, particularly under this current um, regime. And I often think, I should really, you know, I know a lot about Saudi Arabia now. I know a lot about the history. I know a lot about the culture. I should write an op-ed about the, you know, what's going on. I should like contribute to the conversation. It'll be short. I could write a thousand words and like publish something. Great. Uh, and then I'm like, no, I can't, I'm not an op-ed writer. Like I can't, I can't write, I can't come down on the side of like one thing or another. That might also be the Libra in me. But I, <laughs> I'm like, no, I just really, I just need to get back to my novel and keep writing my thousands and thousands of words about this relationship between the two countries. Um, so I'll, I'll read a short piece now, which actually <laughs> has nothing to do with Saudi Arabia, but um, now you know a little bit about me as a writer and why I consider myself a political writer. I think any writer is engaged um, in, uh, any writing is a political act. Um, you know, Marilyn Robinson, in, even in her quietest moments, you know, is a radical. So I, I just think the act itself is, is political. Um, but the piece I'm gonna read today is from this um, lovely magazine called The New Territory. 
and um, it's uh, it's a story that has it's sort of more aligned with my interests that I explored in my second novel, The Unraveling of Mercy Lewis: Reproductive Justice and uh, Women's Bodies, and um, they're particularly young young girls actually. Um, and I wrote that novel in the wake of um, the Maryville uh, rape case in Missouri, and also, and I can never say it right because I always would read it in the newspaper and never hear it. Steubenville, Steubenville, which is here in Ohio, right? So those rape cases, you know, just enraged me. And um, you know, I was also living in Missouri at the time when one of our politicians had talked about you know legitimate rape, and that became um, this buzzword that was going around. And I just it was maddening. So in a way to like keep my sanity, I wrote about these topics, and I've, I've returned to that subject matter in this story. Um, it's a speculative piece. Um, I don't think you have to really use your imagination. Um, you don't have to have too act, an overactive a, of an imagination to to find your way into this future that I've envisioned in this story. Um, but yeah, it's called The Host. It's a little bit um, tricky structurally. So it's about a woman um, who gets pregnant and she's living under, you know, there's been a coup here in the United States and um, this regime, you know, is seeking, seeks to total control over uh, women's pregnancies, including forcing them to register, which actually is something that is done um, in Japan, I just, I learned recently. Um, so it's interesting, lots of different cultures have ways of sort of um, mediating uh, pregnancy. Um, but anyway, so the story is structured, it starts 40 weeks, and it's like right where her due date would have been, and then it goes back to eight weeks when she first found out she was pregnant, and then it kind of moves back to like, you know, 32 weeks or whatever, and then back and forth, it toggles back and forth in time. Um, so, I'll just jump in with, um, at 28 weeks. Ruth couldn't stand the sight of her stomach, so she did everything she could to avoid being naked. Instead of baths, she sponged herself off at the sink. Her hair had grown lank and greasy, her body smelled of mushrooms. Ben hadn't spoken to her since their argument, which meant he couldn't chastise her for loafing around in her pajamas. She nursed a lukewarm vodka and water for most of the day, not because she particularly wanted it, but because she wanted to prove to Ben that she could. When the vodka ran out, she decided to venture out to try and locate another bottle. She'd heard there were a few bootlegging pop-ups along 3rd Street in between abandoned auto body shops. It was this mission that finally sent her to her closet for some real clothes, and it was there, once she had stripped naked, that she realized her stomach was no longer the taut mound of flesh it had been, uh, the top mound it had been, but an uneven bunching of bloated flesh, the skin puckering in on itself like a slowly deflating ball. It had been weeks since she counted the baby's kicks. Now she placed her hands on the withered landscape of her belly and waited, counting ten in her head. Nothing. She turned sideways and examined her profile in the full-length mirror. How big was the baby supposed to be now? An eggplant or a melon? She couldn't remember. Quickly, she pulled down her underwear, examined the lining. No blood or discharge. She put on her maternity pants, though now they fit, didn't fit properly. The elastic waistband bunched at her, at her hips. She walked to the bathroom, brushed her teeth, combed her hair back, and put on a headband to cover her greasy scalp. Maybe she should go to the collective and get measured. So there's this underground collective that she's joined. She wants to, um, under this new regime, they force you to register and, and give birth by, by C-section, so all elements, you know, safety can be preserved, blah, blah, blah. Um, but she's joined this underground collective, this midwives collective. They wouldn't be happy with her for not coming to classes the last few weeks, but she was one of their own. She had spoken the pledge. On the landing, she heard voices. Ben appeared through the kitchen door, followed by a man in blue scrubs and a crew cut. Mrs. Miller, the man said, taking a step forward and extending his hand. Yes? Your husband has made you an appointment at the hospital, so if you'll just come with me. No, thank you. I'm fine. I'm afraid it's not a voluntary appointment, Mrs. Miller. What does that mean? According to federal law, if a husband feels that it is in the baby's best interest, then he can schedule prenatal care. So if you'll please just come with me. She looked at Ben, but he refused to meet her gaze. At the hospital, a squat nurse drew the ultrasound wand roughly over Ruth's belly before turning to the man who had escorted her to the hospital and saying in an affectless voice, there's no baby. 16 weeks. Ruth dreamed about the baby most nights. Thanks to the classes at the collective, she had become one of those pregnant women 
that glowy, spacey kind who floated through days ensconced in a private world, hers and the baby's. In her mind, she saw that the child would, would what the child would look like, fawn-colored hair and dusty blue eyes, Clive's eyes. In bed, she did breathing exercises, listened to Chopin and read Tolstoy, afterward placing her hands on her stomach and waiting to feel the baby kick for the first time. Sometimes she felt as if the baby was telling her to do things, to eat an avocado or go lie in the sun. And she did as it commanded. What the baby learns in the womb, she will carry with her for a lifetime. The baby, that's a line from a book that she's been reading for the collective. The baby was Clive's, she knew it. She rubbed her slight bump tenderly, and it was as if the baby had sent a message to her through the pneumatic tube of its umbilical cord. Go find him, the baby told her. A yearning to, cut, to touch Clive passed over her like a wave. She closed her eyes, could practically <coughs> feel the tangle of his chest hair against her cheek. I will, she whispered back. I love you, she said to the baby. And also to Clive, wherever he was. This baby, a holy collection of their cells, so pure in its amniotic bath, this baby gave them a legitimacy surpassing any law or contract. This baby erased the past. Fear was a damnable thing. It made people cling to the status quo, to believe that the surface of a still lake was as beautiful as the churning ocean, a tool of the regime to keep people small and unhappy. Yes, there were things she would never understand, things that scared her, her own heart and the love it generated spontaneously, irrationally, the child growing in her stomach with its prehensile tail and webbed hands belonging to another world, a dream world where it dwelt in possibility. She wanted to move in that direction of those things, like a tree grown up towards the sun, towards its terrifying resplendency. A person wasn't a collection of traits to be revealed and categorized as known. Safety wasn't divine, and love wasn't a contractual obligation. The feral creature gnashing its teeth inside her told her this. She felt its roar like a deep vibration. Her baby would be a fearless, would be fearless growing next to such a force. As soon as possible after the birth, she would take the child and leave for the territories. She was afraid, but she felt alive. When Ben arrived home from the oil fields, she, a grin ate up his face. Ruth, he said. Already she found his presence irritating. What, she said. Come on, what do you mean, what? He scooped her up in a hug, and though he was freshly showered and shaved, as he always was coming home from the fields, he still smelled faintly of crude. Have you already registered? We can go tomorrow. I want to get one of those little ultrasound pictures framed to keep with me at the field, and I'm not going to register, Ben. Why on earth not? We've got to make sure you and the baby get the best possible care. We are getting the best possible care. She explained to him about Mother Turner and the collective, and though he was skeptical, said it sounded like some hippie voodoo, he agreed to let her have it her way. Happy wife, happy life, he said gleefully. That night, he brought home two fillets and cooked them rare in butter. They ate them on the balcony, looking out across neighbor the neighborhood towards 21st Street. Mid-meal, a rumbling began, growing louder and louder until they could see, see the first in a stream of tanks rolling down 21st, headlights cutting through the darkness. It was deafening. They couldn't hear each other, so they sat in silence until the convoy passed. I'll be damned, Ben said. What is it? Boy on the field said he'd seen them running drills over at the base. I heard a pipeline got shut down by dissidents somewhere west. Is it war? It looks that way. experiences as a civilian growing up in Tripoli, Lebanon during the Lebanese Civil War of the mid-70s through early 90s was um, I was watching a lot of footage and documentaries from the war in Iraq. And the one thing that kept plaguing me when I was watching these documentaries was like, the civilians are really just like an afterthought. You know what I mean? The civilian cost of war is really an afterthought. We always think about war in terms of what we we're trying to accomplish and not what was the cost of it. Um, so, and I realized that I had kind of like a firsthand viewpoint into a civilian perspective 
of war through my father. And that's what kind of inspired me to start interviewing my dad and to translate his story from these interviews into the poems that would fill this collection. Um, so with that, I'll read a poem from the collection. Um, one of the ideas that kind of haunts this work is the idea of borders and how arbitrary they are. One of the central conflicts of the Lebanese Civil War was that of the Lebanese identity. And we're kind of seeing this in the news now with the revolution in Lebanon, <coughs> where the people want a true democracy. They want politicians who will actually listen to the will of the people and take care of its people and its refugee population. Um, but during the Civil War, this question was also at play, where um, the people were divided along religious lines, but also political lines. So you had far right militias fighting against far left militias and every uh, political and religious identity in between. And all of these factions thought that they had the answer for what it meant to be Lebanese. Um, and this poem is kind of written with that in mind. My father is the sea, the field, the stone. I don't know what makes a country, a country. If the sea softening an edge of land is enough to say, this is mine and that is yours. There were nights in Tripoli when there was room for us. When the sky pulled up the wings of gulls and we watched their bodies rise from the beach. Days when I chased my sisters through the market and we sailed through bright saffron scarves past barrels of grain and earthy bins of pine nuts. And how I stood beside my siblings, all dressed in clothes my father made stitch by stitch, and held out my hands for the candy he'd bring if work was good. It was a lot to ask, and still I asked. Some days I'd swim out until I wasn't sure I could come back. The sun beat its indifference into my brow, the water, it's mercy. Why choose a coast when my hands are stone? Why a rifle when my blood is a field? I carry these suitcases full of rain because I can't take my country. If it's a choice you want, I've never known a world that wasn't worth dying for. And I'm going to read um, one of my newer poems because I am still obsessed with the idea that keeps Ira up at night and I need to get some sleep, friend. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and I love, I don't know how many of you watched The Good Place. Yeah, a lot of folks watch The Good Place. But I love that it gives you a nice um, little moral philosophy lesson in each episode, right? And I love that the show really revolves around the question of that famous philosophy book, what do we owe each other? So I've been thinking about this, not only in my daily life, like what do we owe each other? How can we be better to each other? But also in my writing, <coughs> how can I use whatever little platform I have to make this place a little less insufferable? And that's what this next poem is about. <laughs> <laughs> Moral inventory. What good is your goodness really, if it is undone as soon as it begins? I flew over an ocean, slipped with plastic. I am still afraid of whales, even though I know they are choking on our trash. I had money in my pocket from a job of casual corporate unkindness, gave it to anyone who asked. I want to be a better animal. I want to love what I can, while I can. My dogs who caught in the grass, a song that fills my cup and gallops me under a hunter's moon. So what if I snag in her antlers? I once had a body that wasn't a body. It was a voice and a God's mouth. It was the holy vow. Oh animal, I thank you. Oh flank, oh wanting gut, say it matters. Tell me to begin, 
Tell me to begin again, and I will. That's all I got for you. Thank you very much. Um, um, Karen at Ruth and um, Ira, I, I really appreciate your, I'm so glad that someone thinks I'm cool. Um, <laughs> it, feels, it, feels, it, feels really, um, it feels really, really nice um, to be appreciated in that way. Um, I was actually just sort of thinking, as I was preparing for this reading, I really found myself fixated on this term cultural malaise. And I just wanted to just briefly, before I start reading, just to sort of dig into this particular term, because I think maybe, um, Maybe in some sense it may have lost its cultural resonance, and um, obviously the you know I, I love going back to sort of see the etymology of words, and obviously the etymology of malaise is, is French. It means discomfort, um, um, both in the first and the physical and in the <coughs> cultural sense, and it implies an uneasiness, a misalignment, a an absence of pleasure either with our, within ourselves or with society. So T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, David Jones in parentheses, Allen Ginsberg's How, Kathy Aker's Blood and Guts in High School, Claudia Rankin's Citizen, and apparently now Ira. Sukhut so Green is also, <coughs> these authors and their works underscore a cultural malaise with their and our respective times. But the term cultural malaise also contains in itself a kind of nostalgia. Um, um, with, um, for what was or perhaps what could be, almost a, like a future nostalgia. And if we remove the source of our discomfort, all is well. It holds the promise of betterment through resolution, through cure, through intervention, and all will be well. But I wonder also about the ableism of this term. I wonder because all is not well, and I wonder about this need to fix, to ease discomfort when all is not well. I no wonder if we let go of comfort, how do we imagine a poetics of care, an ethics of care, one that withholds self-ratification? I wonder what is a poetics that embraces nausea instead of vertical? And I wonder all this because I'm extremely difficult. And all is not well. I am not well. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we don't respond to injustice, uh, absolutely. Um, climate change, environmental loss, uh, reproductive justice, these are all urgent issues. These are, are, are racial, economic, disability, and gender justice issues to which we must urgently respond. Rather, I'm suggesting, particularly and at least in my case, that environmental devastation, which is a topic that my poetics deeply engages, are, 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 a difficult, uh, are difficult and often incomprehensible realities, and it's not really enough to always just to, be, to, to feel uneasy. We are not well. So by responding with cultural malaise, uh, at least in the way that uh, T.S. Eliot um, and co. certainly did, I wonder if they and maybe we are also failing to comprehend the racial, gendered, structural and infrastructural specificities and non-specificities of the systems and organizations that have manufactured our ecological moment. So to be unwell, I want my poetics to be difficult, both in comprehension and in the content of ecological loss. Poetry for me means for me is a means with which to think about the continuities of infrastructural and structural violence. It is a frame that invites speculation to grapple with climate change and pollution and to be filled with nausea, nausea in its etymological sense of seasickness and disgust. I am seasick when I think about rising sea levels. I am nauseous when I comb through archives and articles on plastic pollution. I undertake field work in landfills and abandoned urban spaces to uncover the relationships between past <coughs> and present environmental change. I do all this because, scholar because poetry is scholarship and scholarship is disgusting. Poetry is disgusting when it encounters the continuities of ecological loss in language across time and space. 
And my book, A Year of Misreading the Wildcats, is my disgusting attempt to understand how a strip of yellow plastic ended up in a tree outside my apartment window in Philadelphia. My research took me through the archives of oil and fracking industries, plastic pollution in the Pacific Ocean, island erosion and landfills in Boston, Pennsylvania, and New York City. And on the screen are a series of Polaroids that I took um, over the course of a year um, uh, for this project. And I'm just going to read from a talk that I gave from, um, at an exhibition um, of, uh, of, the, of these Polaroids that explains my cultural nausea um, and complicity and my complicity in, uh, in, in uh, plastic violence. And this talk is called uh, Waste Natures. And I was sort of um, wondering whether I should read from a poem that is um, <coughs> My, I call it my screaming poem, um, but I kind of feel that this that this environment requires a, a more um, a, a more sort of self-contained um, uh, self-contained reading. So I'm going to read Waste Natures. I'm not going to read all of it, um, but I'll I'll pick out parts parts of it. The architect Ram Coolhouse once said that junk space is what remains after modernization has run its course, or more precisely, what coagulates while modernization is in progress, its fallout. I'm not certain if junk space is an apt term to apply to the contemporary metropolis, but at least gives me a starting point to consider the shifting urban and suburban ecologies in the Philadelphian environs, the place, space, site I call home fantasize, fantasize, fantomize, fantasize where my bones belong and imagine the persistence of nature to reclaim the built environment despite its bruising. I hope my Polaroids puncture the narratives of progressive industrial development by documenting what I call waste natures that coagulate in these urban areas. Although I'm hesitant to even settle on this title description since I don't want to assume that places, spaces, sites to which I refer are stable entities or are the predetermined climaxes of industrial modernity. That is to say, ecological degradation is not partisan and parish of the, city state, of the cityscape. However, problematic titles aside, the waste or wasteful natures I want to document refer to the places, spaces, sites that contain abandoned human ecologies where urban weeds now flourish unapproved, but whose hardy existences are vital for sustaining local wildlife and mitigating petronaut pollution. <coughs> Waste in this instance gestures to the excesses of both human production and the policies of ecological restoration that underpin the logic of the original wilderness, isolated from human presence. As I continue to document these urban islands, my project will focus more and more on flora and fauna, the slippages of oil, oil imaginaries concretizing in city spheres, rather than the buildings and landscapes themselves. The petroleum program. Oil is a sentient form of life, combining labor, environmental injustice, and the monstrosity of plankton. Oil makes the wound go rogue. That is to say, Philadelphia is inky mayonnaise. For the time being, the sites documented in the series include the Willow Steam Plant on Poplar Street in Chinatown, the former Delaware Oil Plant next to Pico Park in Fishtown, Petty's Island between Philadelphia and Camden, the former feed, lot, a feed building opposite Innovation on 34th Street. All these buildings are beautiful because they are vacant but not empty, empty but not vacant, boarded up, but their thresholds of chronic possibilities are open and spiteful. Bioremediation would signal the end of our tacit complicity in urban ecological violence, and I would prefer to feel thickened with guilt, the ethics of bodies and wanting contamination. Let the oil become sentient and call me to venom. I primarily choose sites that have yet to undergo renovation because I'm interested in the ways that the wilderness retakes the borders of human habitation, although I'm partial to buildings of the pastoral imaginary, like the D.P. Martin Company headquarters at 3000 Market, which used to house one of Philadelphia's abattoirs and is currently occupied by another type of culling industry, the Kaplan Company, which services the SATs and GRE markets. Future sites to be investigated include the Reading Viaduct, to which I've not yet gained access. A poacher nought I admire tells me that they were already renovating the site, and I picture highland islands with tulips and cobblestones, bodies without bones sprouting seagulls from torsos. The exploration of the afterlives of these places, <coughs> spaces, sites dovetail into the, into the afterlife of the antiquated Polaroid medium. All these photographs were shot with an original Polaroid Sun 600, but using film that is compatible with this camera since the original analog Polaroid film hasn't been available since 2008. The prehistory of media frequently follows its future, that is to say, 
the perception engine always recycles. That is to say, the economies of retroaesthetics determine reception. That is to say, obsolescence is a renewable resource. That is to say, nothing goes away. In the meantime, the original Polaroid film is becoming hard to find in any viable form, and even the emulated Polaroid fo format has a short expiry date, meaning the undeveloped film has a very small window of feasibility. More, its instantaneousness is primarily a marketing ploy, since it can take up to 45 minutes for a color picture to fully develop. It is also an environmentally damaging medium. Each cartridge contains an unrecyclable battery and undeveloped film to produce only eight pictures. In brief, the Polaroid is not a stable medium, nor is it useful for long-term preservation. Soaking pictures in tap water, the colors kink into fragments of the photographic paper glacier. Its ecological unfriendliness sinks guilt every time I take a picture. But the Polaroid is really a document in time, a means to capture ephemera. That is to say, photography is dependent on plastic, and plastic is deep time. That is to say, the plasticity of emotion is loving towards light. That is to say, the image is a translation of light and oil. For this reason, the Polaroid has been a vital instrument for the film and television industry to document cosmic <coughs> pop and set continuities. Notwithstanding poor resolution and limited space, it speaks to the language of convenience since one can quickly shoot a number of photographs that can be distributed among on-set crew for the purpose of creating shots and hot sets. Point being, I think the Polaroid captures the intimate relationships between the moment as opposed to the instant and the continuity of space. Space is loving light. In particular, I'm curious about what kind of spatio-temporal rhetoric this medium now affords for identifying and questioning the logic of ecological restoration. Although digital photography challenges the indexical bond of the image, the Polaroid too troubles the actuality of space and time by underscoring the relationship between the slow burn of chemical memory and the politics of the environmental image. Perhaps the super objective of my images is the way that the analog photograph can problematize the notions of ecological restoration as a progressive continuity from untouched wilderness to industrial modernity, to ecological degradation, and finally, to landscape regeneration. A photograph records a place, but not a site. It senses a space, but not always the place. What of the site that no longer exists, the phantom island that leaks from a nightmare, is erased from the map? Is it still a place or a space? What is the difference? Discuss it slowly. I want to get to the Q and A, so I'm going to forego the reading of my essay, and I just want to I want to thank everyone up here uh, for for your contribution. But let's 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 talk. Let's talk. Um, so back to my midlife crisis because everything revolves around me. Um, I think the thing I struggle with most uh, when I think about social responsibility and rhetoric is that I feel like we're living in a world that seems to have lost the art of communication, right? Like uh, the art of dialogue. I think people are talking at rather than talking with. And so I guess how do we as writers get people to talk with each other rather than being talked at? great point about our cultural moment. Um, one of the things I was thinking about on my drive here um, today is the way that, um, and I was thinking particularly about fiction, um, because of those ambiguities that I was talking about earlier, uh, it, cre it, it creates space, I think, for conversation. So I was thinking in particular about um, a book club that I visited to discuss my second novel. And um, it was a group of like deeply religious evangelical women um, and the, my nanny um, who took care of my my youngest son was there and she invited me um, and she's one of my dearest friends. And um, But I was you know nervous to say the least about visiting this group um, to talk about, about the book. But it was a fabulous conversation because, I mean, it was difficult in a lot of ways, but because we were talking about characters, you know, because I think in, particularly when fiction is working well, it's not just hitting you over the head with answers, right? A lot of times it's, it's asking questions and it's making room for exploration. So in that space, in that room for exploration, in that room for questioning, um, we could coexist there. So. 
they, much more right-leaning uh, and, and deeply religious uh, women, um, and, and very much pro-life, could coexist with me in conversation um, because we were talking about characters who meant something to these women, even if they were making choices that the readers did not necessarily agree with. So what was great is that they could see the character's humanity and then talk about them like they were their flawed relatives or something. <laughs> and so it was a really actually a comfortable space for us. Um, and I, I also think about fiction because I think one of the great, one of the things I love most about fiction is it's both like sword and shield, right? So you can just slash and prod and like <laughs> be aggressive and you know, think of yourself like, when I wrote my second novel and I wrote an essay at the back of the paperback version of it and it talked about how furious I was as I was writing it. And I, I wasn't sure if I could write a good book in that state of, like heightened state of anger. Um, turns out I, I could write a pretty good book in that, in that state and I think it, it lent the book power. Um, but I, I think it also was powerful because it wasn't a screed, right? Um, because I was asking questions and exploring that gray area. Um, and I, I just, I think that, um, I'm just losing my train of thought here, but, <laughs> um, great area, creating, oh, the sword and the shield. So the sword and the shield, um, so you can make very, you can assert yourself and your opinions and your thoughts through your characters, but you can also stay, remain protected in a lot of ways behind that. Um, that uh, sort of veneer of fiction. So I, I've often, you know, I've done that. I've hidden. It. <laughs> um, and it's fantastic because, and I think it enables authors the world over to, particularly in countries like Saudi Arabia, in countries like Turkey, where you can be put on trial or exiled for what you write. Um, it allows these writers to write really radical things um, and write dangerously, but stay protected, like behind that, um, that shield of fiction. So oh, I completely agree. I think when I when I write fiction, the, the one thought that, that always goes through my mind is I don't want to have any narrative responsibility at all. <laughs> <laughs> that I will make my characters do the work. I will make them flawed. I will make them ugly. I will make them do ugly things. And that becomes the criticism of the story itself. But I don't want to claim the responsibility of their actions. Right? I think that's the beauty, beauty of fiction for me is that you, there's a or that way to hide. Um, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna kind of switch to, to poetry though. So my my uh, 103 class, we're going through poems right now, right? And they're 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 sitting like a couple of them right there. Um, and we were talking about why, in times of cultural turmoil or tragedy, does poetry is the, the genre that most people turn to is poetry, right? And I, I'm thinking of of course to of like the civil rights movement and thinking about Ami Baraka's work and I'm thinking about also, you know, the 1960s and the beat generation, the politi politically charged poems that are coming out. So is there something about poetry um, that makes people turn to difficult times? I think about this too, I think when the September 11th happened, um, uh, the New York Times released an article talking about poetry. Poetry is the thing that all artists are, are going to now. I think that it helps that poetry is concise. <laughs> I mean, um, but I find that the magic of poetry is that it gives a language for a very interior, internal experience. And I think in times of turmoil and grief, we kind of reach for a language that maybe our culture at large doesn't give us access to, but poetry does. And so I think that's my personal philosophy about why why poetry helps in times of I was just going to add, because I, I think the answer <laughs> might actually be in Ruth's poetry as well, because it's one thing that I noticed about your poetry is that, and you mentioned this yesterday, that it was a collaborative effort um, between, a collaboration between your father and yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that poetry is a means with which to build community. Mm -hmm. um, and it is also a means with which, maybe because it is also, um, it can be very open, uh, open, open form, um, that it enables a kind of, um, Conversation that can develop between uh, between um, between poets 
um, that can build towards a consensus. That's how I interpret it. I mean, for me it personally, poetry is always a form of scholarship. It's involved in critically um, engaging um, 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 because I, I personally shy away from interiority. Um, and, and, but I think, you know, it's, uh, and I'd love to hear more from you, Ruth, about sort of like more about your, your relationship between building community and through your poetry, but also sort of building family relationships as well. I mean, I'm kind of fascinated by, sorry, I, I'm fascinated by that. No, yeah, I, I think that that's a great point about, and uh, so my partner is a fiction writer, and we talk all the time about the difference between like how fiction writers tend to operate in the world. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm well aware of yeah. like, our many flaws. <laughs> very lone wolfish, right? But you drop a poet in like a literary scene, and we're gonna make friends. Like we're gonna gravitate toward each other in a way that like maybe other writers don't really seem to. Um, I'm a little biased. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Creeley, you know, um, he talks about a community of poets um, for that precise, for precise reason. That it's like um, community mm -hmm. engagement. And I, I wonder too if like community and poetry tend to go hand in hand because poetry is so often performed yeah. in a way that prose isn't necessarily performed. Like, it's hard to find a prose reading in any city, right? But you can usually find a poetry reading or an open mic or a poetry slam. Yeah. And so I think it's just like the, the nature of poetry kind of tends to invite people to come watch, to come participate, or to share. So that might be it. Um, as for the your other question about creating community, like with my family. Yeah, I, I mean, like, I'm just get, like, like, I'm interested in sort of like your interviewing process as well, because that's not really such a touching, touching, intimate. Um, yeah. Because it's, you know, if we're thinking about social responsibility, then um, it's always at a grassroots level. Mm -hmm. I believe that it starts at the local, the very local specific before. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> 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 like, go, it, you know. Yeah, it blooms. But like, <laughs> a, maybe on a hyper personal level, um, there is a kind of there is a trust in yeah. my dad willing to share his story with me, understanding that it would be like shepherded through me out into the world at large, right? And so, um, you know, establishing that trust through the conversations that we had, not only about his personal experiences, but also like, okay, how is this going to take shape, like? How are you going to use the story? And like just being fully transparent with him and how I intended to uh, discuss his experiences and how I intended to translate them into like poetry and like form and feeling was really important too. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> perfectly. Um, I have one question. This comes from so last year um, I was able to attend. Claudia Rankin's uh, lecture, and the week after Roxane Gay had had come, come to town, and their responsibility, their 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 talks were so different, right? Um, and the the question that was asked at both talks was this: Are you a pessimist or you're an optimist, right? And with Claudia Rankin, she said, "I'm an optimist. I have a lot of faith in the younger generation. They are more socially aware than we have ever been." They are born into the language of social awareness, right? Roxanne Gay said, things are gonna burn before it gets better, right? And so she, she was more of a pessimist. And, and maybe, maybe this is something, also <laughs> poet, <laughs> fiction writer, maybe there's something to be said about that. So I think to maybe the last question for, for this is, are you, are you an optimist or a pessimist about, about your, your role as a writer in, in the world we live in right now? Mm. Yeah, go with that one. <laughs> Sit with that one a bit. I think I have, um, being here at Kenyon, being on a college campus, being around um, people much younger than me, uh, <laughs> uh, has been, um, is, is heartening, and I think is wonderful uh, in a lot of ways, and I think makes me optimistic. I love, in my classroom, how I see my students embracing their queerness and in fact that has like helped me embrace my own in a way you know it's something I've never talked about before with my family and I finally brought it up with them and it felt so good and that was like something I just got a comfort level I got from my students um, 
and I just appreciate them so much for that. Um, in the meantime, though, I'm like getting you know the articles from my sister about Williams College, Oberlin oh, College, gosh. all these things happening, Yale, these explosions happening um, on campuses that have been you know deemed comfort colleges. I'm sure you guys are aware of that term, um, and. So again, I think optimist, pessimist, like which way are we going here? Um, and I tend to, right now I'm, I'm feeling, I don't know why, because things are pretty dire <laughs> in, our, in our political uh, scheme, but um, I'm feeling optimistic um, at this point because I, it can't get any worse. So, right? <laughs> we, we, can only, we can only go up, um, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, from here, um, I, I also I, I see like the foundations of our democracy being tested right now, also, and I see so far that they are holding. Um, it's kind of like how I felt in my house um, in Oklahoma when there would be a fracking earthquake. I would just be like, "Please walls, like hold, please walls." And so that's how I'm feeling right now with our with our country, our government. You know, please, please, democracy, hold. Um, and I think, I think I feel optimistic because I know that we will soon be pushed out um, and that this next generation will come up um, behind us and, and unfortunately you know, have to clean up our messes, which is terrible. You guys want to Yeah, I don't, I don't think that I feel optimistic. I think that <laughs> Human nature has proven that we have a talent for being horrible. <laughs> and um, I just don't think that our leaders are acting with the kind of urgency that we need to unfuck this, you know? Um, and I do think that things are getting worse. <laughs> I'm sorry, I feel bad for being dishonest, but like, you know what I'm. When I'm alone with myself, these are. This is exactly how I feel. I feel like this country has shown its underbelly with this administration. We've all we've always known that America is deeply racist, that America is deeply sexist, and now it's just like that shit is out in the open, and everyone's very comfortable with talking about it now. But it's always been here. It has always been here, and so I really resist the language of oh, now more than ever because why? Why now more than ever? We've always had racism in this country. You know what I mean? We've always been reticent to address climate change through our political leaders. So um, yeah, I, while I hope, I, in my grinchy little heart somewhere, I hope that like people smarter and better than us will take the reins and you know help lead us out of this point in time, but I don't know. It seems like the clock is just running down on climate change and we're all just watching. So, <laughs> sorry. I, <laughs> uh, I, I am a humanist. Um, um, I, um, I'm not gonna answer that question because I'm kind of curious as to the rhetoric that's involved and um, uh, between uh, the rhetoric involved in optimism and um, but I think, that, and pessimism, but I do think that I've got an answer in a, in a series of questions in my last, in one of my poems, and it, it reads, it's, it's one of my carbon sink poems, um, and it says, who are we in this moment? Monsters, lobsters, or human globsters? The answer is floatable like jellyfish. Does the ocean hurt? Are you hurt? Do you feel pain? Time to pipe the spills into new rifts and wanting. It's time to plant something more monstrous to grow. And that's my answer. That's a perfect way to end it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for coming.